The main achievement of the Suharto years was to achieve considerable economic growth. So Indonesia, when he came to power, was a very poor agrarian society in which most people lived in villages. By the time he stepped down, there was a significant growth of urban centres, of a middle class, and particularly of a manufacturing se uh, sector. That achievement, though, came at great cost in terms of uh, human rights and restrictions on political freedoms. And most of the other achievements that people point to, for example, um, uh, maintaining Indonesian unity uh, were also, uh, also came at great costs in my view. So it's a more negative sort of balanced book than a positive one. So since Suharto stepped down 15 years ago, Indonesian politics have changed almost beyond recognition. Under Suharto you used to have a very tightly controlled political structure in which one political party was dominant and the army played a significant political role. Now we have a cacophonous very um, uh, heterogeneous political situation with a great variety of political parties competing for power, a great degree of decentralization compared to the Sahado government which was highly centralized. Um, we see a very um, uh, vocal and active media landscape um, with a very critical uh, press uh, and also electronic media. So Indonesia has become a much more plural, a much more raucous uh, place politically. What hasn't changed, well there are several things that haven't changed as well, um, underlying, uh, some of the underlying structures and some of the underlying assumptions or beliefs uh, in Indonesian politics. Just to give two examples, one is that uh, Indonesia remains quite an unequal place politically, there's a high degree of economic inequality, which was one of the inheritances of the Suharto regime, and seems to have even got a bit worse uh, since he stepped down. So that although uh, in political terms there's a great degree of political freedom, often the people who are most able to benefit from that political freedom are those who acquired wealth and status during the Suharto years. One other area of continuity uh, is the high degree of suspicion and hostility towards uh, political actors who seek to achieve independence uh, from Indonesia. So there's a great deal of hostility towards uh, independence supporters in Papua, for example. That is very much uh, part of one of the legacies of the Suharto government. If you talk about Suharto's legacy, you will have to start with the fact that he presided over one of the largest political massacres in human history. Now, he came to power in 1965-66 amidst an unparalleled slaughter of uh, Indonesian communists. Uh, more than 500,000 people died, something a lot of people overlook because they focus on either his achievements as an economic manager or on his repressive apparatus that he put in place once he had established himself as the president of Indonesia. But in fact, he owed his uh, coming to power uh, to, once again, a massacre that is in the same category as the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia uh, or other uh, massacres in, in world history. So, you know, that is the starting point uh, for evaluating um, Suharto's legacy. At the same time, you do have a much freer, a much more open society. People are allowed to express their opinions. We have the, one of the most free presses uh, in uh, the Asian uh, region. Um, you know, associations are free to, to form, political parties are mushrooming. All of that you can have, apparently, while at the same time uh, securing uh, strong economic growth, and that's something that nobody thought would be possible so quickly uh, after Suharto's fall in 98.